Hi, and I'm back. Welcome to a new season of 100 on Books. And also, welcome back to me being on video, because honestly, I mean, what was the points of our channel? Do you know what I mean? Um, and because it's a new season, we're doing things a little bit differently, which includes having a guest. And I'm so excited about today's guest because... I really, really, really like this person, you know. So it's nice to have somebody who you like IRL on the URLs. So joining us today is Wendy Njoroge. She is a book lover, a reading advocate, and a community builder. When she's not being a mom to her several plants, one cat, and four human babies, she works as a curator at Books and Wine. It's a community of book and wine lovers who love to explore and discover books and wines from all over the world. She's also the chief bookstan at Somanami Books, a bookish hub that encompasses a bookstore, a book club, a book subscription box, ooh, and a book cafe. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, Nyambura. Thank you for having me. I'm so, I'm so happy to have you here. I mean, like, so just some context for the people who are watching this or listening to this and wondering, hey, why are you so hype? Wendy, <laughs> slid into my DMs. Listen, first of all, more people need to slide into my DMs. See Mutani <coughs> we ne- we on need Twitter. To, <coughs> we need to verify Not this Not .mutant on Instagram. <laughs> uh, more people need to slide into my DMs because I am, I am uh, always open to bookish conversations. You can't see the <laughs> wink, but I winked. I'm like Rihanna. I don't know how to wink. Um, <laughs> no, so Wendy slid into, into our DMs and... And she said, hey, hey, do you guys want to meet up? You guys was um, the co-host of my podcast at that time, um, Two Girls Two and Girls a Pod. Pod. Yeah. And she said, you guys want to meet up? And, and I have books for you. I know. And you have such a special place in my heart. Oh, thank you so much. I used to listen to you guys every new episode. Ugh. And I remember like going to work and listening to you guys and you guys setting the mood for my day. Oh. So giving books was the least I could do. Thank you so much. Mm. Listen, I mean, this is not a, a fan girl, um, you know, exercise. We're here to conduct some very S- important talk. business, some serious business. And just to start us off, you know, uh, set the mood. I'm really curious about your journey as a reader because mm-hmm. you do all of these bookish things. And yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering, how, how, how do you become a reader? And before we, we started recording, you were telling me about how, and people, let me tell you, there's a lot to be unpacked here. But when you were telling me her 12-year-old has a Kindle because she's such a voracious reader. And so I'm interested <laughs> in your journey as a reader, but yeah. also your how, how one goes about bookish parenting. Ooh, that's a, that's a, a very twofer. interesting question. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> Actually, my earliest memories of owning a b- books was um, because I'm, I'm, in a back, I'm, I'm born in a big family. I'm number five out of six. So I have older siblings. And one of my elder sisters had a boyfriend who was a reader. Like he always used to walk around with books. And so I think when he realized that I had an interest in books, he used to buy me books. So I remember reading Alfred Hitchcock, the detective series, um, <clears throat> the regular princess stories, you know, and what else? And then, of course, I graduated to stealing their books, books I had no business reading at, say, like 10, 12, you know, John Grisham, Sidney Sheldon, the usual staple, Mario Puzo, uh, Major Mwangi. So I don't remember a time when I was not in love with books. Yeah, and... I just hope the same translates to my kids. So I give them a required reading list. (laughs) Well, it's okay, teacher, mom. (laughs) I know I'm just like really uh, uh, fortunate to have a child who loves loves to read, who is reading me broke, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So hence the Kindle part, because yeah, ebooks sometimes are a little bit more accessible. And the price is better. Mm. Mm, yes. And also, I mean, Wendy knows this, but we stand libraries in this house. And yes. libraries are a great way, especially for the voracious readers amongst us. I mean, my mother ended up with two reading children. And let me tell you, the Kenya National Library Service 
really came through yeah. for that lady yeah. because we'd probably have read her out of house and home, <laughs> you know, with the rate at which we were reading. I know, so right? I totally get where you're coming from. Like there is this, there is a need obviously to keep supplying. You know, it's like if you're on a, on some level like a drug dealer, but it's <laughs> it's a good drug. <laughs> you know, it's a sort of drug. Um, we we would like our children to be consuming. I don't know why I'm True. saying we like I'm a parent. No, by association. I'm, I'm doing that the, thing you're the village. Our women, our children. <laughs> Who is our? <laughs> you're the village raising. <laughs> okay, so um, some more background. So when mm-hmm. I when when we first when I first met you, you were in a marketing role at a at a local bookstore chain. Yeah. And I'm curious about whether you've always worked with books. Uh funny enough, no, I. For the longest time, like since I left school, I used to work in advertising, which was really a lot of fun, a lot of fun and fun times and a lot of hard work. And I enjoyed that for a couple of years until I needed to like switch up things. And so I saw that troll come up on my LinkedIn. So I said, hmm, a bookstore. I've always been a lover of books, but Mm -hmm. I thought that was a hobby, not work, right? So I said, let me try it out. You never know what happens. At the very least, I'll probably get free books. So that was my incentive. (laughs) (laughs) And I stayed there for about five years. And I got to meet a lot of great people, like just understand the industry a lot better, meet a lot of nice, wonderful people doing great things like Nyambura. And yeah, we're here now. How was that transition? Because I worked in advertising straight out of or out of uh, high school. Ah, it's brutal, Not right? high school. Come Uni. on, girl. Hey, you've been working since 18. All my life I had to <laughs> fight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I meant um, uni. Mm-hmm. And it was, it must have been quite the transition for you because... Oh, yeah. Advertising, TM, is it's a world unto itself, oh, I feel yeah. like. So how did you make that transition? Um, you know, I, I had just like burnt out from the high frequency that advertising runs on. So I really needed to do a 360 career-wise. Like I just needed to have a life outside work. And um, so I was open at that time for whatever. So getting a serious 8 to 5, you know, where you're getting at 8 and you leave at 5 and you're guaranteed you're leaving at 5 and you have a whole lunch hour, it was like a dream for me. Coming from working like 14 hours and some weird hours, weekends, events, things, oh, yeah. It was beautiful until it got boring. (laughs) (laughs) I also feel like the sort of people who work in advertising have this, like, you know, they chase a certain thrill. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, it, things will, other things will get boring, you know. Yeah, so. true, true. You get My, used to that and then everyone else looks like they are, they are in slow-mo. <laughs> <laughs> are you slow? Why, why are you not are responding slow, are to are my fast? emails that I sent at 10 p.m.? <laughs> Questions that need answers. Yeah. Um, so we, I know you work as a curator at Books and Wine, and I'm curious about what informs the Books and Wine pairing. If mm-hmm. I remember correctly, this is Chilean Wine Month. If I'm if I'm not wrong, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know what? COVID has thrown us all over the place, mm-hmm. so we are not at regular programming. But um, this was born out of uh, love for the two things, like books and wine. And the need to explore and widen my horizon. So I figured, why not bring other people along, you know? As I get to learn more about books, um, more about wine, expose myself to more books, meet people. I'm telling you, this is the reason why this is what happens when you don't have friends who have the same interests with you. You go about starting (laughs) all these kinds of communities so that you meet people who like the same things as you. So that's where Books and Wine was born. And uh, before COVID, of course, we used to have really nice meetups uh, to explore wine. Uh, I bring a Somalia to talk to us about wine, tell us, you know, swirl it like this. You know, this is how you dip your nose in and, you know, (laughs) all the fine, fine things. Yes. So um, from there... Uh, then, of course, the books is the conversation piece. 
It's because you, it's not a drinking party. It's a, you know, it's a discovery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a difference. Mm-hmm. So that's been books and wine for before COVID. Uh, um, well, in quarantine, we've just been um, connecting online, which is very different. And yeah, we're working on a couple of other things like um, doing a shop to books and wine. Um, I realized that a lot of the things we recommend, people don't know where to get. So that's come about as a natural transition. So we're really excited about that. Um, From our website, we are building out a shop that hopefully all our fans can get access to all the nice things that we talk about. Yeah. So um, just to go back, because this is really, I mean, I don't drink anymore. Anymore, the <laughs> operative word here is anymore. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I'm I'm curious about about that pairing. You yeah. Know, um. How how do you say this ah. book and this and this wine okay. go together, or ah. like this region and I mean a region makes some sense. I okay. think. Okay. Okay. Like, so we we we've been switching it up like from time to time. So we've had poetry. So basically, we'll just take inspiration from a general topic. So like um, the poetry we did, we did a love theme. So like what wines sort of communicate that kind of message. So you'll have your rosé, your bubblies, and then of course poetry, because who in love does not write missives <laughs> to their <laughs> beloved? So <laughs> so that, that was one. And then we've had uh, some episode where we um, had a spoken word artist in in the in the audience perform their their book. Uh, that was very interesting. So and the wines from that time, I forget the theme, but we switch it up so that if you keep coming back, you're not coming back to the same show. We make sure you we expose you to um, several wines because that's a that's a goal to lower the risk of trying something new mm-hmm. because when you're at the shelf you look at the bottle and you're like hmm, I'm not sure what exactly Riesling means or a Chenin Blanc means so let me just stick to my sweet red that I know and trust right but if we bring you to an to an environment where we tell you this is this and this is that you get you give yourself a mission to try same as books and I feel that's like same as books if somebody reads a passage for you from a book that you don't think is your type you're willing to you know give it a shot yeah and I I feel like that's a theme in your work Mm -hmm. this whole giving people room and you know like a, a structured way in which to to try things to explore things and so on which I think is such a fantastic thing because that that happens often in the world of books right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I was having this conversation with somebody in regards to this podcast actually where they were saying I feel like I don't understand the things you're talking about when you talk about books and it's like it's just it's just books it's a hobby you know but the it helps to have some sort of structure, which is what, for instance, really good librarians do. They yes. they direct you in certain directions. They curate, essentially. The, exactly. Which is what you do. Yes. Which leads us to the other curatorial position you hold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is, um, you are constantly, I feel, curating communities about around not just books, but also like literary ideas, mm-hmm. literary movements, literary happenings, and so on. And... Um, how do you go about which books to highlight, which ideas to highlight? What, what's, you know, what's the chemistry that leads mm. to, you know, the Powerpuff Girls that are <coughs> all of your different ventures? <laughs> you know, um, uh, actually, I wish there was like a plan and a design to all these things that I end up getting into, mm-hmm. but <laughs> there's none. There's no five-year strategy and all those things. It's just like following my gut and following my passion and seeing where it leads and being a fan, first of all, and looking for those things. And when I don't find them and thinking, but why not create them? You know, so I some the other thing that I do is that um, my partner and I, her name is Mudoni, very, very magnificent human being. Uh, we run something called Somanami Books, which started out in a very interesting way um i 
still part of like several book clubs uh, because yeah why be in one when well, you can be in several <laughs> why indeed the more yes. the merrier <laughs> So uh, we were in a book club together and actually we met because of books, which, yeah, again, the uh, story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I met Mudoni in a book club and we used to be in a book club called Bookish People. And uh, we read some very interesting books from 2018, 2019. And uh, when the pandemic happened, of course, through our things out of mode because we used to meet uh, individ- um, in person. So when the chemistry of in person was not there, the bookish people sort of started wavering and winning out. And we thought, let's just redo this thing, right? Hence, uh, Somanami Books, which is just, is more than a book club. So we took the book club idea because that's, that's the heart of it. Books are about people coming together, appreciating them, reading them, taking them apart mentally. Not Do not touch a book <laughs> <laughs> physically, take it apart physically. Yes, so, and we, our goal, and that's what we are working on, is to build out a bookish hub, yeah, which is, um, encompasses the book club, of course, which is free and open to all, and a bookstore, uh, to bring in the books that we really want to read. Oh, you you you, you live in Nairobi. We are going so to take you know. a break here. <laughs> we are going to take a break in this transmission for me to say something. <laughs> Wendy, please vent. <laughs> yes. Butter, honey, pig bread. Butter, pig, honey bread. Listen, I've even forgotten how to Francesca say its title. Equine. It's by Francesca Equinasi and. Yeah. Guess what these people did? These people brought in a book and are selling Amongst it for others. a full 2,900 pesos a Kenya. Now, <clears throat> I mean, are some granted, of the, yeah. the, it's, it's also, it's not cheap where it's coming from. Even in yeah. the States, I know for a fact it's, it's like, $20 or so. It's, it's yeah. not cheap. Yeah. And that's... It's probably cheaper here than the UK listing because I think it's That's about uh, 18, 16 pounds or something like that. That's true. Yeah. And I mean, like, I know this is, you You had a whole statement you were about to make, but <laughs> let's unpack that. Why are books so expensive in this country? Ah. Stares directly into the camera. Yes. Um, <clears throat> this is now above us. <laughs> <laughs> is it every day? <laughs> We are going to hand this over to. I I know. I think the the whole structure of how uh, books come to reach con- readers' hands, it's riddled with so much, and um, including taxes, uh, which I think, you know, the, um, a book is an essential thing, should be zero rated. But yeah, they are not. Uh, importation, uh, the fact that if you look at a lot of uh, publishers, um, like their websites and stuff, their information, where we fall in the globe is not considered very significant. <laughs> so you'll see that they probably have agencies in uh, Middle East and Africa, which basically means uh, Egypt, and South Africa, and the Horn, you know, uh, Dubai and the rest. And that's like the closest that we are from somebody actively marketing and trying to bring books to sub-Saharan Africa. So for people that are going out of their way to make sure that they get uh, these books available, the costs mount up. And yeah. It I mean, is the <laughs> but let me just say, if if anyone wants to have someone who has experience in advertising come on and help them with their political platform, and their platform includes zero rate books, <laughs> 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 I don't say this often. And Kenyan politics, I've a lot of politics is very messy, but yeah. 
I will contribute to that platform. I will I will write a blog post, you know, yeah. I will I will make a, a post or something because this is it's such a huge barrier to entry for so many of us, you know, like some of us who have voracious readers in our house, who have Precisely. voracious readers ourselves. Yeah. It's such an expensive hobby. Mm-hmm. You know, if if a book on average is going to cost you 1500 shillings, that's let's let's call it 15 US dollars. Yeah. And you're reading maybe in a, in five, one six books a month uh, or something. For special people who read a book in one sitting. I yeah. don't know what they do with their lives. <laughs> So if, if, if you're spending kind of 9,000, 10,000 shillings a month, if, if the cost of the books you're reading is yeah. 9,000, 10,000 mm-hmm. dollars a month, I mean shillings a month, which is the cost of a bed sitter, oh sorry, a studio apartment <laughs> in, <laughs> in some parts of in Nairobi, greater Nairobi, you know, um, it, you can't afford it. True. And, and I feel like we're always having these conversations. I, I remember, <laughs> I'm going to have her here one day, yeah. Ah, <laughs> was, okay. was was. In an argument on Twitter, about, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not asking you to answer for Modoni, but mm-hmm. <laughs> this is a conversation Modoni was having on Twitter about how uh, um, there's no way for us to justify piracy and so on. And some people were saying that the cost of books by the time they arrive here is yeah. so high that that might be why people engage in piracy. Yeah. Obviously, I respect creators. I love how I keep turning to the camera so that the camera knows I'm taking this very seriously. <laughs> but um, that, that is something. But you, you know, know what else can be done on a public sphere mm-hmm. is build out a, a library infrastructure, mm-hmm. public library infrastructure. And it's possible uh, because I think the two go hand in hand. The space for libraries and the space for commercial booksellers and I don't know if there's been like deliberate effort to um, to make the you know like the Kenyan National Library Service accessible, machinani outside the big towns. And well, we are lucky we're in Nairobi, but that's not everybody's story. Um, not everyone can go walk into a library and get access to books. So there's also that the zero rating. I hope the government is taking notes on these things. They better, I mean. (laughs) (laughs) There's zero rating books, and then there's building community libraries. So I think that would go a big way, a a long way into, like, just alleviating the whole thing of access. Yeah. Yeah, because I know um, KNLS, with the promulgation of the 2010 constitution, uh, Mm -hmm. set up um, a library in every county headquarter where okay. there previously was not. You know, some of those traditional provincial headquarters had yes. libraries, your Embu, your Kisumu, and, and so on. Yeah. So there are more libraries in real terms. But yeah. again, we go back to, which is a thing, um, I, I'm, I'm just going to ask you. <laughs> we go back to the fact that there are not a lot of African books in those libraries. For instance, KNLS gets a lot of books from Book Aid, yeah. which donates British books or the books that are hot in, in the UK. Yeah. And they're generally not African books. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So, and that's something I've observed that your your endeavors really have a focus on, you know, uh, books from the global south, which is a, a, a huge concern of mine on 100 on books. So maybe talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so at uh, Somanami Books, uh, especially the book club side, we made it very deliberate that we only read books by Africans. Uh, written by Africans or people of African descent uh, because uh, traditionally we don't have access to those things. And those are the books that we feel see us and those stories talk to us and we see ourselves in them. So we have that bias to amplify the stories that have people that look like us. So, yeah, we... (laughs) A bit unapologetic about it, yeah. And what's that to apologize for? If you go on BookTube, like we are right now, because this is going to also be uh, on YouTube, yeah. there's such an overwhelming number of, not just Westerners, Americans. 
Yes. So and and of course because they read American books or books published in the US, yeah. it it means the internet, the the bookish internet skews a certain way. Yes. And if you want to participate in those conversations, you need to be talking about what uh, they are talking about. You yes. Know? And so I think it's such an act of courage and and such a necessary act, such a, a radical act to say we will center African stories, you know, mm-hmm, we will center mm-hmm. stories by people of African descent because, yeah. I mean, no one else is checking for us, you true. know. <laughs> <laughs> true, 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 But true. let me get off my little soapbox no, and we, um, mm-hmm, go which, on. Which reminds me of something that really just, like, great at me. Um, there's the Heinemann uh, African Writer Series that... <laughs> Speak on it, please. <laughs> that I keep crying about every two weeks on the internet. Um, these are books that were published from the 70s through the 80s and I think early 90s. And they that was a revolutionary thing because they took uh, Anglophone writers, uh, Lusophone and Francophone, and did translations across. And they published many people in their hundreds of course, right now we remember Chinua Chebe, Ngugi Wathiongo, Ama Taido, the people that have gone on to publish other books outside the, the Heinemann uh, umbrella. But those books uh, at the pi- time of publication that were in their hundreds, right? And try looking for those books today. Ooh. <laughs> I could write an essay about this, okay? <laughs> in, in contrast... <laughs> Uh, your average library uh, bookstore will have a Dickens, will have Shakespeare, people that have been dead over 400 years or more. They've been dead, yeah? you know. <laughs> so you can see <laughs> the kind of voices that are surviving and the ones that are dying off. So I think us prioritizing ourselves is, like you said, yeah, it's a radical act of self-love. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I don't know who will petition. You said this is on YouTube, right? Yes. So please, YouTube people. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we really need that series back in print because if it, goes, if it dies and goes out of print, future generations will never know that those books were, were ever written, right? Yeah. And remember, we grew up even on the pesetas. Mm-hmm. I look for those things so much. I can't find pesetas anymore. That's, honest, I mean, I don't say this lightly, and I know I'm going to sound melodramatic, but that really is tragic. Exactly. Because I, I really value archival records, and everything we are, we are doing is mm-hmm. building into an archive, you know. But what happens when every 20 or so years the archive is essentially being erased, which is what's happening. If you ah. can't find AWS books... I think I told you this on Twitter, how yeah. I, I spoke to a professor at an American university and he'd been given a huge budget in the thousands of dollars yeah. to essentially hunt down every AWS title. Wow. And it's become he a had, collectible. he had found them. He had found so many that he even found duplicate copies that he gave away. That's he was so like, tragic. well, you know, I have book 50, you can have it. And I mean, I was thinking to myself, your average Kenyan public library does not have those books. Or at least does not have the complete set of those AWS titles. And as you're saying, they were so many. Yeah. But that is our literary tradition as yes. Africans. Yeah. Uh, because AWS was the largest project to put out the African Writers Series, in case anyone is wondering, what is this AWS? <laughs> it's not Amazon Web Services. <laughs> yeah. It is African Speaking Writers Series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and there were all of these books that... that um, Chinua Achebe was the was the first editor, if I remember correctly, and he they put out all of these books, which most of them now are nowhere to be found. You know, mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. like hunting for a needle in a haystack, and it shouldn't be that because we should yeah. be able to say in the same way as you're saying, Westerners are able to look back to Dickens or Austen or insert name here. Yeah, we should be able to easily exactly. reach back to to those authors. You know, so he iwe changamoto. Whatever you. <laughs> I mean, like, oh, whoever Excel has power, so yeah, exactly, <laughs> Mexico Hill is uh, horrible. <laughs> Changamoto <laughs> is the only thing I had on deck. Uh, now, it's used. Finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I don't know if you remember, but uh, I've met you at literary happenings, and Ooh, it's always it's yes. always a nice thing to hang out with Wendy at literary <laughs> happenings, because she always buys me drinks. <laughs> 
<laughs> when she was drinking. I sound so thirsty. Like, all I want is to be bought drinks. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Mm. But uh, I'm curious about what you think makes for a good literary happening, a good literary event, a good literary... Yes. Um, even, as you're saying, since now you're curating book boxes and things like those, which that's so exciting because yes. the, num- the jealousy I used to feel seeing people unboxing book boxes in the West and being like, why can't we have nice things? I want that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think goes into the making of a, of a good book happening? If someone is listening and they're like, I too yeah. would like to start something bookish, what, yeah. what do you think? make what's what goes into the magic Bef- before i go to the magic mm-hmm. uh, you've touched on the book box something close to my heart mm-hmm. so let me sound off on that um so <clears throat> we uh Modoni and i had this lovely idea that people would like to receive like a book book bookish gift bookish box and we were not wrong because uh, we've been putting together this uh, subscription box. Initially, we thought, okay, this will be for everybody who wants to reward themselves every month. Like, yes, I'm my own fan. I'm gifting myself every month. And there's that. But a lot of more people are giving other people, which is really lovely to see. And which I'm, I'm a bit hurt because nobody has what me one yet. Don't I have friends? Wow. Nyamura, <laughs> am I not your friend? Wow. 